Greetings from Dr. Peter McLuhan in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to take a moment to wish our Orthodox friends around the world a blessed Good Friday. In this homily, I will speak about the seven honorable words Jesus said as he was being shamefully treated. Africa has produced many great champions. Their victory cries have been heard all over the world. Prophet Isaiah recorded the voice of God saying, out of Egypt, I called my son. The greatest champion the world has ever known was protected and nurtured in the womb of Africa. Several years ago, I had an experience that radically impacted my life. I was in the ancient city of Cairo for a few days before traveling across the Libyan desert to visit Benghazi. It happened in a bakery shop. One of the owners approached me with a book he wanted to give to me. He showed me the title, Let the Bible Speak. He said he thought I would find the book very interesting. He was right. This book was so filled with half-truths and distortions and lies that it lit a fire in my soul to help Muslims understand the crucifixion of Christ. Muslims who are raised in a culture of shame and honor are only able to see the cross through the lens of shame and defeat. And the book pointed out that Muslims reject the crucifixion because the way they see it, Jesus died a shameful death abandoned by his closest followers and rejected by God himself. Yet because they recognize that Jesus was a prophet, many Muslims believe that the disciples cleverly switched Judas for Jesus. What a shameful thought. Those who know the facts know that Judas had already hung himself in shame and his disciples had fled in fear. If there were any truth to this lie, Paul would never have been able to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. As a result of this experience, God moved me to write a message for Muslims called Shame, Honor, and the Cross. God opened my eyes to see honor in every word that Jesus uttered from the cross. What could be more honorable than to ask God to forgive one's enemies? What could be more honorable than promising a dying man a place in paradise? What could be more honorable than making sure your mother is cared for before you die? What could be more honorable than quoting scripture when you feel abandoned by God. During what was perhaps the most difficult moment of his crucifixion, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22 and verse 1. He uttered these words to remind himself of God's faithfulness. He is quoting from Psalm 22 that is filled with rewards for those who trust God in difficult circumstances, and even when we might feel abandoned by God, we can still say these wonderful words, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried, and they were rescued. In you they trusted, and they were not put to shame. Psalm 22 verse 4 and 5. What could be more honorable than Jesus declaring his trust in a God who will never put anyone to shame? What could be more honorable than saying, I'm thirsty? His physical thirst, as real as it was, was nothing compared to his spiritual thirst to redeem all that was lost in the Garden of Eden. What could be more honorable than the cry of a champion saying a loud voice, it is finished. While it takes three English words to say it is finished, Jesus uttered just one word. It is the Greek word tetelestai. Note with me that Jesus did not say I am finished. 
He declared, it is finished. The first century use of this word helps us understand much more than is conveyed by the English translation, it is finished. There were no less than five different ways this powerful word was used in the first century. When a servant reported to his master at the end of the day to say that his work was done, he would say, Master, tetelestai. <clears throat> and by that he meant, I have completed the work that you have given me to do. The price for our salvation was paid on Calvary, but the battle for our salvation was fought in the Garden of Gethsemane. The battle was won when Jesus accepted to drink the cup of the Father's will. Our battle is to drink the cup of the Father's will. Like our Savior, we need to believe that no matter how bitter the dregs of the cup are, he will give us strength to complete the work that he has assigned to each one of us to do. Artists or writers used to use the word tetelestai in this way. When they completed a painting or a writing, completed a manuscript, he or she might say, tetelestai, it is finished. As a pastor, I used to complain that my work was never done, but then I came to realize that this is not how Jesus wants me to think about his will for my life. This is what he said, the son can do nothing of his own, Accord except what he sees the Father doing, John chapter 5 and verse 19. And then he said in John chapter 17, I have glorified you on the earth, having accomplished teleo, the root word for tetelestai, the work that I have given you to do. I may not finish my painting today, but I can finish painting the part of the canvas of life that God wants me to paint Today, I can finish each day. I am learning not to take on tasks that the Lord has not given me to do, and I'm learning to not neglect the tasks the Lord has given me to do. I'm learning to go to bed each night, finishing the work that I have been called to do on that day. I'm learning to declare tetelestai over every day of my life. <clears throat> Uh, creditors used the word tetelestai in this way. When a debt was paid in full, the creditor would write across your bill, tetelestai, the debt has been paid in full. The feeling of having a debt paid in full is one of the greatest feelings in the world. Paying off a car or a medical note or school tuition or the house payment, it is an exhilaration beyond description. It's one thing to pay off a debt ourselves, but when someone else steps up to pay off the debt we owe, we feel both humbled and blessed all at the same time. However, this good feeling is nothing compared to the glorious truth that the debt of our sin has been paid in full. Is there anyone listening to this message who is excited to hear that your debt has been paid in full? <laughs> Is there anyone who wants to shout with me, my debt of sin is paid in full? Shout with me, my debt of sin is paid in full. Glory, glory to God. My debt to God is paid in full. I really appreciate the way the priests used the word tetelestai. When a priest examined an animal brought to be sacrificed at the temple, and found that it was without blemish, he would say to the person, Tetelestai, this animal is an acceptable sacrifice. All four of the gospel writers tell us that Jesus was crucified on what the Jews called the day of preparation. Now, John thought it was so important for us to know this that he reminded us three times that it was on the day of preparation that Jesus was crucified. What happened on the day of preparation? Join me for Passover in Jerusalem in the year AD 33. The morning sacrifice was offered on the altar when the rising sun lit the sky as far as Hebron. <clears throat> After the morning sacrifice was over, waves of men 
brought their lambs to the temple, three groups of 100,000 men at a time were allowed to enter into the court of the Levites. Although the weather had been beautiful that morning, right at noon, a sudden darkness came over the city. Three blasts were heard from the silver trumpets played by the priests, saying that it was time to sacrifice the Passover lambs. And so there I was with my lamb. I laid my hand on his head. I confessed my sins of ignorance. I was really nervous. I asked the priest if he would kill my lamb for me, but he said he could not do it. The sins I had confessed were my own. The lamb was my own. It was my responsibility to slay the lamb. <clears throat> he handed me the knife. He pulled the lamb's gullet forward and showed me where to strike. I thrust the knife into the lamb, and as blood gushed out, two priests holding consecrated bowls of gold and silver caught the blood and carried it to the altar. Blood, blood from my lamb was cast on the northeast corner and the southwest corners of the altar below the bloodline. And while all this took place, the Levites were singing psalms of praise. The Levites sang the first line, and we repeated what they had said. And this went on until each man's lamb had been slain. Our group was almost finished when it happened. The earth began to shake. I thought the temple was going to fall on top of me. I was terrified. And from where I could stand, I could see into the first part of the temple as far as that massive thick veil that protected the Holy of Holies. At first, I heard the sound of material tearing. And then before my eyes, the veil split from top to bottom. The attending priests came running out of the inner sanctuary, crying out to God for mercy. And then in an instant, Jesus did in the spirit what the writer of Hebrews would eventually tell us. The high priest enters once a year, not without blood, which he offers for himself, and the sins of the people that had been committed in ignorance. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 7. But, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained our eternal redemption. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. <clears throat> I realized that while I offered my Passover lamb to God inside the temple, Jesus was crucified as the lamb of God outside of the city. While we were singing psalms of trust in the temple, Jesus placed his total trust in God outside of the city. God did not disappoint Jesus. In the spirit realm, he was released from the cross. He passed through the torn veil. He entered the Holy of Holies. And from there, he ascended into the tabernacle, made more perfect in heaven. And there he sprinkled his own blood on the mercy seat of God in the holy of holies in heaven. And as he did this, the angels began to sing, you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and nation and people. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. God said to his son, Telestai, you are the perfect sacrifice. There's at least one more distinct way that the word Telestai was used in the first century, and I want to speak about that. When an athlete crossed the finish line, he cried out, Telestai. Come with me to race day at the magnificent stadium in Aphrodisius to watch the greatest sprinters of the day run for a laurel wreath. Picture with me the athletes lining up at a starting block. The first century athletes laid aside every weight and encumbrance that might slow them down. 
They've looked away from the crowd. They fixed their eyes on the finish line. The starting gate drops. The runners leap forward. They can feel their muscles beginning to burn. They can hear the pounding of their competitors' feet. And then with a final burst of energy, the winner lunges across the finish line and cries out, Tetelestai, I won! The writer to Hebrews says, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. This is what we want everyone, and especially our Muslim friends, to understand. Jesus was able to endure the shame of the cross because of the joy that was set before him. He knew how to despise shame. What does it mean to despise shame? It means to consider something not important enough to be concerned about when compared to what will be achieved. The shame of the cross was not worthy of consideration in light of the honor that was to come. This is the attitude with which Jesus faced the cross. The shame he endured was nothing compared to the honor He would enjoy being seated at the right hand of the Father. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, he was not just saying my ordeal is over. He was not just saying my suffering is ended. He was saying that the devil threw everything he had to throw at me and I defeated him. I have defeated him. He tempted me with bread. He tempted me with angels. He tempted me with kingdoms. He tempted me with popularity. He tempted me with power. He tempted me with compromise. He tempted me with alcohol. He tempted me with abandonment. But I have defeated him. And yes, he bruised my heel, but I have crushed his head. Glory. Jesus did more than endure the agony of the cross. He defeated the devil. This is what every one of us, including all Muslims, need to know about the cross. It did not end in defeat. It ended in victory. The ordeal of the cross did not end in shame. It ended in honor. It ended with Jesus saying, I have defeated the devil. The first time I lectured on shame, honor, and the cross was in Niger, speaking to a group of pastors, mostly from a Muslim background. As soon as my lecture ended, a bishop came up to me and embraced me warmly. He said, this is exactly what we needed to hear about the cross. I used to be one of those Muslim preachers, taking verses out of the Bible, out of context, and making up whatever I wanted to say about them. I argued with Christians in the marketplace and on radio and on television. I had no idea what I was talking about. I only saw shame in the crucifixion of Jesus. I used to ridicule and mock Christians for what they believe. I never saw honor in the cross. And even as a Christian pastor, I was afraid to speak about the crucifixion because I did not know how to present the message in an honorable way. So what can we learn from these words? It is finished. Tetelestai means we can complete every assignment the master places in our hands. We can close our eyes every night, having done Father's will for our lives. We can live debt-free spiritually by daily confessing our sins. We can live without shame because we are spotless before our Father. We can walk in victory every day of our lives. Say with me. Victory is mine because of the cross. I have victory over darkness, victory over principalities, victory over sin, victory over death, victory over greed, victory over hatred, 
victory over adultery, victory over immorality, victory over temptations, victory over habits, victory over finances, victory over depression, victory over confusion, victory over troubles, victory is mine. Tetelestai, I have victory. Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, stand on your feet and join in the cry of the champion by saying with me, Tetelestai, Tetelestai, I have won, I have won. Victory is mine, victory is mine. Amen and amen. As you've listened to this message, the Spirit of God has opened the eyes of many to see that an honorable man died in a shameful way by the hands of shameful people. Father has opened your heart to see the death of Jesus provided a way for you to be forgiven. You no longer need to be afraid of death. Jesus is offering you the gift of being forgiven by God for not understanding the cross. Jesus is offering you the promise of paradise that he offered the dying man. If you are thirsty for spiritual water, Jesus will fill you with the Spirit of God. Receive what he did for you on the cross right now. The Bible says, as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name, John chapter 1 and verse 12. Receive Jesus today. Become a child of God. Recognize that Jesus died for you so that you can live for God. Join me in these wonderful words. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lived, but Christ who lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. If you're ready to make this confession, stand right now where you are and accept Jesus as your Savior. Say with me, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me on the cross. I accept that Jesus paid for my sin on the cross, and I receive him as my Savior right now. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill me with your presence and give me the assurance in my heart that I am now a child of God. Before Jesus died, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. His physical life ended in the hands of God. The Roman centurion who watched how Jesus died said, Truly, this was the Son of God. If this message has opened your eyes to see that Jesus was more than a prophet, we invite you to accept what he did for you on the cross. Your sin was paid for by the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Receive him as your Savior today. Say this with me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me in my place on the cross. I receive you as my Savior today. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk with someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as $1 a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International, Incorporated. All donations to Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with Living Hope.